Okay, let me not trip over. Uh, let's get around here into the camera. And let's look at the synthesis of an ester. I'm just gonna straighten up my camera a little bit. So we get the whole board. Not quite square, but that'll do. So again, um, this is just the introduction and then I'm gonna run through the prac. This prac does take a couple of hours to run, so I'm really just gonna run you through the key highlights bits. I won't make you watch a full two hours of me, but you know, it'll probably still be much a bit longer than all quite a bit longer than those other three prac videos I did the other day. Um, synthesis of an ester. So to make an ester, we need to take a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, and then when we add them together, they will form our ester, and we also form water. Because we form water, we call this a condensation reaction. Water forming on a piece of glass or something like that, on the inside of your windscreen, we call condensation. So. That's where that term comes from. So the one that I'm gonna to do today is we're gonna take ethanoic acid, or acetic acid is its common name, so two carbons, carboxylic acid group, ethanoic acid, and I think this one might have actually been in one of the book or the tests, practice test questions, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we're also gonna take an alcohol air, three methyl butanol. So um, I've just drawn it here because it sort of makes it easier to show the ester forming. So I've drawn the, the alcohol backwards, if you like. But we'd start with where the hydroxy group is, one, two, three. Methyl group, one, two, three, four, longest carbon chain, three methyl butanol. And when we react those, in a sense what happens is the water that forms is formed from, um, doesn't really matter which one we do, um, the water is formed from it losing that hydroxy group and that hydrogen ion there, and that forms the water. And then after that breaks, we get basically a bond bore forming between that carbon there, oops, and this oxygen here. So that's the this oxygen here. You see that? Yep becomes this oxygen here. So as the two join, um, as we go through this, and I'll talk more about this as we go through the prac, but this just relates to the sort of questions that you get. We do this under reflux. I'm gonna show you what reflux is when we go through this and how it works. The reason we use reflux is A, it produces, it provides heat. Heat will help increase the rate of the reaction. This is quite a slow reaction. We will also use a condenser the condenser, and you'll see what that does when I do the video, the, the prac, will prevent the loss of reactants and products by evaporation. And we're gonna add concentrated sulfuric acid as well to our initial um, reaction mixture. And this basically just acts as a catalyst, provides an alternative pathway for the reaction, which is, helps us increase the rate of reaction. Um, um, no, I won't even go how that alternative pathway works. Um, if you go on and do organic chemistry at university, you'll learn how those pathways work. It did come up in one of the questions in the book, but it is well beyond what's in this course, and you don't need to know about that. So, that's the introduction. What I'm gonna do now is set this all up as a prac, and video through particularly all the key stages of what's involved in that. Cheers. Okay, we've Gloves on, lab coated up. We're actually dealing with some quite dangerous chemicals with this practice. This is why it wasn't one I could easily bring on the road. Just to demonstrate, um, one of the chemicals we're using is concentrated sulfuric acid, which we're using as our catalyst. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this done before, but it's a really good demo. This is just sugar, glucose. Um, what we're gonna see here is basically an, an extreme example of the hydrolysis of sugars, so the breaking apart of sugars. Um, which can be done with concentrated acids. So what I am going to do is very, very, very carefully, because this is uh, that's here, that's 95 to, it's worn off the label, something sulfuric acid. This is as nasty as it gets. I'll just stand up for a sec. I'll just carefully pour that into the beaker. 
And I need a little bit of this for later, that's why I'm getting it out, but I'll do this demo as well while we can. And if we pour this sulfuric acid into this sugar, like so, and just let it soak right through. That should be enough. Now, right now, you're probably looking at that and going, Stan, that's really boring. That doesn't look all that toxic. While I continue setting up the rest of this prac, I just want you to continue watching this and see what happens. Keep watching. I'll be back. You'll see me working in the background. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, seven minutes and 15, five seconds. But here we go. 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 Okay, I think you get the idea of what's happened there. That is basically just one black charred carbon mess. It might go a little bit higher, but I want to keep going with this prep, so I'm not going to let the video keep running any longer. Anyway, that's the dangers of concentrated sulfuric acid. Okay, sorry. After I moved it away, it fired itself up again. So you can see what's happened there now. There's also the very distinctive smell of um, burnt sugar or what you might only commonly known as toffee. Anyway, I better get back to what we're supposed to be doing and making an ester. Okay, back ready to make the ester. So what I have here is a pear-shaped pear flask, which we're gonna Put our reaction mixture, um, our reactants in. I'm going to heat it from underneath here with a Bunsen burner. Um, heating flammable liquid through the Bunsen burner generally not best practiced, but it's the only way in the laboratory at school that we can heat them. Um, if you work in actually university and commercial labs, they do have better heating systems that don't rely on flames, which are safer, but are far, far more expensive and need much, much more specialized equipment. So this is why we have to be really careful with this prep. So we're gonna put our reactants in here. So we need to add 15 milliliters of the alcohol. Just measured out with a measuring cylinder. So that is the called isoamyl alcohol or by systematic name 3-methyl-1-butanol or 3-methyl-butanol, which is what I talked about before at the start. So we just carefully pour 15 ml of that in. We then need to add 10 ml of glacial acetic acid, concentrated acetic acids. I've just poured this into a beaker to make it a little bit easier to pour out and a bit safer. Um, it's quite difficult to pour from the big one, the big flask, two and a half litre flask. So there we go, we've got 10 ml of our acid and we're gonna add that. Now, that's very, that smells like very potent vinegar. Um, the other thing that it's important to add is some little boiling chips. I've just got here, you probably hardly see them, but it's just some broken bits of porcelain. When we heat this, if it boils too quickly, we get what's called bumping, where it all turns to gas and it basically just about explodes upwards. By putting these little boiling chips in, and you don't need to know the theory of this, but basically it gives an area for little gas particles to form as it starts to boil and it lets it boil in a much more controlled sense. 
and just decreases some of the risks associated with it. And the final thing I need to add is my catalyst, which is the concentrated sulfuric acid, which is over in the fume hood. I'm just going to use one of these measuring cylinders. I just need one mil of that, which is basically up to there on this um, little pipette. I'll come back into the circuit after I get the once I get there. I don't really want this to drip on the way. So we add one mil of sulfuric acid into there. Now that's had concentrated sulfuric acid in it, so we've got to be really careful what we do with that. And what I'm going to do is, actually I'm just going to put it, I've got a baker over here with water, I'm going to put it in this. Okay. Just, you don't want someone to accidentally touch that. Now as you see, we're getting a little bit of discoloration happening in here. Now, if we just heat that now, this reaction is very slow. So what will happen is all those reactants will just boil off, evaporate, turn into gas before they can form the ester, and that's not much good. So we're gonna use a condenser. A condenser, can you see? Where's if I find the, which side's the camera on? I'm not sure, it's on that side. Anyway, that's hollow through the middle. Not sure if that's picking up on the video. And then it's got this water jacket around the outside. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have cold water from the tap, which I still need to connect up. Cold water from the tap. Get this on pretty good because I don't want it to accidentally come off. Cold water is gonna come up in the bottom go up around the outside jacket, come out of the top into the sink. And that's just gonna continually cool all the vapors that form as it boils. And then as they cool, they'll just drip, um, condense back to a liquid, drip back in so that they've got the chance to continue reacting. So we just turn the tap on gently here. We don't want the tap too fast. We just wanna get a nice steady stream of, oops, that's going on going in the sink, steady stream of water happening on this end and then we put that in there and we are all ready to go and we don't want to put a stopper in the top that would create pressure then it would cause potentially an explosion somewhere that's sitting a little bit wonky because of just the hoses um, I think that's okay so what I need to do now is apply some heat and make sure I don't melt these rubber water hoses in the process. And I actually haven't got any matches yet. So I'm gonna make sure air holes are closed to lighter. Um, hopefully the gas is on and I'll just find some matches. Okay. Broken match. Don't make matches like they used to in the old days. Okay, light our match. Gas on. Hopefully we've got gas. I checked before I had gas. There we go. Um, I think this bench is sort of at the end of the line in the Bunsen burner, so sometimes the gas takes a while to come through. So I'll just let that get a bit better steady flow of gas. And then we'll start. Oops. Just need to get the gas going a bit steadier, and then I'll move it around to the blue flame. I hope I haven't got a dodgy Bunsen burner here. I've not got much go about it. And it went out. Okay, I'm not really winning here today. 
this often happens. I'm just going to try this side. Sometimes the taps are a bit blocked when I'm not real hopeful. Let's see how we go. So I'm just going to hold this up to apply the heat. And then that should start to get it boiling quite quick. Yep, you can already see start to boil there. Might just bring the camera in a little bit closer for this part. see almost that bumping now as I'm, I'm putting too much heat in and it's boiling too quick. Now I'm a little bit, just need to turn my water up. You can see my water pressure is decreasing. I don't want that to not produce enough water so that we get loose vapors over the top. Now the other thing I meant to show you before was that initially we just had that all as one layer. Um, what you'll start to see in a minute, well, we'll talk about that later, but, but initially everything sort of mixed in together. So that's boiling away reasonably nice. Now what I'm gonna do, so I don't have to hold that the whole time, because I've got quite a low powered Bunsen, which I don't really mind actually for this prep, because too much heat can be a problem. I'm just going to lower the setup. And just get that bubbling away gently. I'll just go a little bit higher. And that is reflux. Boiling away gently so that we're providing heat. The vapors that are forming. Probably just go down a little bit over your nose, I reckon. The vapors that are forming are coming up into the condenser. The cold water that's in the surrounds of the condenser is causing them to evaporate. And then, they're not quite yet, but in a minute, and I don't know how well you'll be able to pick up into the video, but you'll be able to see, yeah, basically the reactants are running down the inside of that glass there back into the um, pear-shaped glass. And it is a bit of a... Just want to get that right boil. I don't want it over-boiling. Don't want it not boiling as well. want my water level going about right. I reckon that's pretty good. So I probably need to leave that boil away for, well, between 30 minutes and an hour. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm gonna pause. I might just then start recording and then just fast play it or something like that. But basically, this is reflux happening away. And hopefully this reaction, which you can't really see, is happening now between our acetic acid or ethanoic acid, now three methyl butanol to form our ester and water. Yeah, just so I knew where that gap was. Okay, so that's been going for half an hour. So what I'm gonna do firstly is just turn the heat off before I can do too much more. I will need to let that cool down a little bit. But hopefully you can see now we have two different layers here. We can see this sort of browny orangey layer at the bottom, and then that's distinct 
from the layer at the top. Let's take this face mask, face mask off. Um, that will, um, will, one of those will be the polar layer, the water-based layer um, from the water that's formed in the reaction. The other will be the non-polar layer. Um, I'll show you in a sec how we distinguish between the two. But just gonna leave that sit tight for a couple of minutes and let it all cool down. Do any of you guys ever eat banana lollies? Yes. Just from up here. Now, I don't want you to snort straight out of it. Just <laughs> waft it towards you and see if you get that smell of banana lollies. Asha, you've got a mask on. A little bit. Actually, yeah. A little no, bit. It's kind of like a chemical smell. Though. A yeah, chemical yeah, smell. Is, if we went and got a pack of banana lollies, it would be that a little banana bit the same. lollies. Not smell. identical. Not really identical. No, it has, definitely has the tangy chemical smell, you know? Yep. So if you tasted it, it wouldn't taste Why well, don't you taste it? Don't taste it. You <laughs> don't taste it. it. No. Okay. You can see we've got our ester here cooling down. And just while that cools down, I'm just going to talk through the theory of some of the next things that we're going to do. So at the moment in there, we have got a mixture of the 3-methyl-butyl ethanol that was formed as one of the products. Plus we would have water in there that was another product that formed. But we would also still have some of the reactants here. This reaction, strictly speaking, we should write with that equilibrium arrow. We have a forward and a reverse, and this doesn't go completely two products it would have if you like um it wouldn't have a really really high equilibrium constant if you remember back to the equilibrium constant being the ratio of products to reactants so what we need to do is separate out the reactants that are left the product ester and the water that formed and also the sulfuric acid which is still in there that we added as a catalyst and we're going to use two techniques to separate that stuff out the first thing we're going to do is separate some of this stuff out on solubility. Ethanoic acid, which basically is what's in vinegar, you dissolve in water. So that will go into the aqueous layer, but some of it can also go into the, the non-polar organic layer. 3-methylbutanol, again, it's got a polar OH group. So, you know, it's a bit non-polar, it's a bit polar. It can sort of divide between both a non-polar and a polar. 3-methylbutyl ethanoate, it's a large non-polar molecule, or it has a large non-polar section, no OH groups, so no hyd uh, hydrogen bonding. So it's quite insoluble in water, just a couple of groups that can dipole-dipole bond. So in a sense, some of these remove themselves because they don't stay with the more non-polar layer, but we can even force them out more. One of the main things that will be left will be the um, acetic acid or the ethanoic acid. If we react that with carbonate, carbonate plus acid gives basically salt or an ion plus carbon dioxide plus water. So we're gonna add some carbonate in a minute. When we add that carbonate, it will form the, it'll go from the acetic acid to the acetate ion or ethanoic acid to the ethanoid ion, depending on what naming system you wanna use. This can iron dipole with water. Now iron dipole interactions are much stronger than just hydrogen bond interactions. So that will be much more soluble in water. Remember, water is the polar solvent. So by taking it from something that can hydrogen bond, so it'll dissolve relatively well in water, to an iron, it'll dissolve even better in water. In water, we talked about that with drugs and giving them in the iron form so the body can absorb them faster. So that is what we are gonna do in the next little bit is, um, um, it's basically, it's similar salt, it's a solvent extraction type technique, so it's similar to what we did with getting the bromine out of the bromine water into the cyclohexane, uh, the cyclohexane when we did the test for alkenes in one of the previous videos. So, 
I'll pause and get set up to do that. Okay, back again. So I've got my separating funnel, uh, same one I used for the bromine with the alkene, so it's been cleaned out. And I'm gonna take my reaction mixture here, which is still warm, but not too warm. And I'm gonna pour that into here. For a sec. So, <coughs> um, yeah, it's quite a strong smell. Has got that banana smell. Now I've got two layers in here. I want to know which is the water layer, um, which is the non-polar layer. Let's bring that in closer. So what I'm going to do is just add a little bit of distilled water. And that distilled water is sitting, oh sorry, that distilled water has actually made the, the bottom, let's shake that a bit, that's gone down and mixed with the bottom layer. So the bottom layer there is the water layer, which is the layer that we don't need. So what I'm gonna first do is use this separating funnel and I'm just gonna let that bottom layer go. Now I'm putting it into a beaker just in case I stuff up, I can easily recover it. So now I've got mostly my non-polar layer. But as I said before, still some of the acetic acid, for example, could be in that non-polar layer. So I'm gonna add some sodium carbonate, which will react and turn it into ions and that'll push it more into the water. This sodium carbonate solution is in water. You can see probably, as I add that, we're getting effervescence which is indicating there's some acetic acid in there reacting. Then I'm going to put a stopper in here. I've got to hold that stopper quite firm because it will create gas. I'm going to mix it. You hear that little fart of gas coming out. That was the carbon dioxide gas that formed. Even bigger fart. So while we're still getting that gas produced, that's showing that there must still be some acetic acid in there that's um, reacting, forming carbon dioxide. So we'll keep going. Keep going. Okay, we're seeing a little pop there, but not getting as much gas produced. So I'm just gonna let that settle out. You'll see as that settles out, it settles into two layers. That top layer is our non-polar layer that has our ester. That bottom layer that's becoming clear now is our aqueous layer. Just let that keep settling out. The best background is there. That's reasonably settled out now. And again, I'm just going to let that, I'm going to take the stopper out so it runs. I'm just going to let that bottom layer go. And I'm just going to repeat that once more. Um, just, we don't know if the fizzing stopped because we ran out of carbonate or we ran out of acetic acid in there. So I still get a little, a little fart, for lack of a more technical term. Ooh, bigger one that time. And it doesn't matter if we don't get this perfect, it's really mostly about demonstrating the technique to you guys. And that's just about run out of fizz. Yep, it's just about run out of fizz. So again, just going to let those two layers settle back out. We've got the, the, the polar water-based aqueous layer at the bottom. 
that had the carbonate and hopefully it's got some more of the acetate ions in now and it's taking them out of that top layer. And we've got our non-polar layer. Now that non-polar layer at the top hopefully is mostly our ester but probably still has a lot of the alcohol that we started with because that alcohol has a relatively large non-polar part, so it'd be relatively soluble in a non-polar solvent. Um, yeah, there's our alcohol there. So quite a big non-polar, just that OH group. So it would potentially still do have some impurity there. And that's what we're gonna look at next. So let's just leave that, for, put that down for now. And I'll talk about what we're going to do next. The theory of what we're going to do next is, you know, hopefully we've got rid of most of this ethanoic acid, but we might still have some of the alcohol present with our ester. Hopefully most of the water has gone as well. Um, sulfuric acid is reasonably soluble in water, so hopefully most of that's gone. But what we're going to do next is a distillation. So a distillation is a way of separating um, things based on the boiling point. This is basically how they make petrol. They get crude oil, which they take from the ground. They basically then separate all the different chemicals that make up crude oil based on their boiling point. The ones with a really whole boiling point are the oils and the tars that they use for oil and making roads. Uh, in the middle, you've got things like petrol, diesel, kerosene, um, all of those things, which basically they're, they're smaller molecules therefore less dispersion forces, therefore slightly higher boiling points, so they boil off easier. Um, and then there's some things at the top which have quite low boiling points. We don't need to get into the whole theory of that. So for this purposes, water. If there was any water present, which we don't think there'd be much, that should boil at 100 degrees. Ethanoic acid will boil at 118 degrees. 3-methylbutanol, that original alcohol, will boil at 132. And the ester at 142, and if there was any sulfuric acid left, it will boil at 310. So, I am now gonna set up a distillation to show you how we can separate those things based on their boiling point. So the setup, well, the equipment that we're gonna use is gonna be quite similar to the equipment that we just used for the reflux. You'll see how that works in a minute got my pear-shaped flask, I've just cleaned that out so it's nice and clean, and I'm going to add my product from my reaction from the separating funnel into that, just a tiny still little bit of solvent that I cleaned it with there, just clean that out with a little bit of ethanol. So we're going to let that run in our shop, let that run into there, just that um, non-polar layer. We've left the boiling chips in there because again we're going to boil this to separate it by boiling point so um, that'll just help us control that boiling. And then we are going to start with a bit going on here now. Just make some space. Try and make it so you guys can see that well from the camera. So we're going to put the our product from the reaction before. Now rather than the condenser going straight in top now, we're going to use this uh, T-piece and that goes in there and then we are going to put a thermometer that sits in a stopper in here and that thermometer will go down there so that thermometer is going to let us tell what temperature the vapors are and obviously the different um, the different components of that mixture will boil at different temperatures so we can look at the temperature that they boil at um, and when that vapor comes across um, we can basically collect and isolate it. And the way we collect and isolate it is we use this condenser because when it boils, it turns into a vapor or a gas, comes up into the T-piece, goes down this tube. Once it gets into this tube, 
I've got the condenser, so it cools the gas down. The gas cools down, it turns back into a liquid. And then we are gonna collect the liquid at this end, which I need one more bit for. That collecting tube there. And then I just need to grab some conical flasks so that we can, as it boils, separate the different parts that come across at different temperatures. So I've just grabbed three little conical flasks that we'll use there. Now, generally, just for the sake of safety, we need just one more retort stand. This one gets a little bit tricky. So I'll bring that in. Uh, let's come in this way. And then that goes down. There. Really tight. Sorry, I just dropped the Bunsen burner into the sink there, but that's no drama. So we're just going to put that on there, maybe up a little bit. So that will just support that condenser during the experiment. And I have one of those under there ready to catch. And I need to feed my Bunsen burner back through here. Now again, we are using a flame to heat flammable solvents. So I need to check really carefully that all of these joints are sealed really well so that we don't get any leakage of fumes that will then ignite and make this a far more interesting video than I want it to be. So, air holes closed, gas on. There you go. Switch that back to a blue flame. I've already got soot on my glass, which I didn't really want to do, but that's okay. You can see that's starting to boil quite quickly. Better turn the water on to the condenser. See those bubbles going through the condenser. So at the moment, we are just bubbling away. keeping an eye on the temperature of the vapors there but at the moment no it's still quite low still at the top around about 40. Just put a bit more heat into this. Now we can just start to see I don't know if you picked that up in the video but you can start to see vapor starting to come up and that temperature of the vapor uh, the collar is in the way at the moment so I can't see it all that well. You can see vapors, I don't know if they're coming up in the video, but there's vapor now going into the condenser. And I've just got too much heat there because I can actually see vapor coming out this end. So I'm just going to turn the water up because I want to make sure that in this condenser, all the vapors that form, sorry, I lost my heat there, all the vapors that form get turned back into a liquid. Better. Oops. Find some burner just went out. So let me just put that back. 
back onto the orange flame. Dodgy, dodgy, dodgy matches. There we go. That black color is just on the outside of the flask because I had it on the yellow flame for a bit. So at the moment, we can see all the vapors up in here. They're condensing still up here. We don't really want them to condense here. We want them to condense in the tube. But no, I can just see some liquid starting to come through now. It's just running down. I don't know if it's coming up. You should see a drip very, very soon. There's a drip forming. Drip, there goes the first drip into that flask. And if we have a look, the temperature there is, uh, so it's only showing about 80 degrees at the moment, but sometimes there is a bit of lag in that thermometer. So let's just see what happens. What we'll, in an ideal distillation, we will see that the, the first thing comes across and then we'll almost see a pause as all the everything at that temperature boils off and then the next layer will come across. Now the reality is here we're separating things that don't have a huge difference in boiling point, so it's just, you know it's a bit hit and miss this technique, but it it's definitely showing you how a distillation works and what's supposed to happen. So we're up to I think yeah, we're up to 120 degrees now. So I would think before that was sitting at yeah, just below 100, which might have been the water. Okay, that's going up quite quickly. There's a bit of a pause there, so that might be the end of the alcohol. Now we're up into oh, hang on, 130 degrees. Sorry, that probably changed that a bit early. Let's look. Yeah, so that's sitting steady at the moment at about 130, so that's probably still the alcohol coming across. The unreacted alcohol that we started with. The moment is really hard to read. coming with a rush now and that is up to 140 so what I'm going to do now is hopefully most of the unreacted alcohol has come across so I'm going to switch my flask again and hopefully this flask here should be collecting most of the alcohol um, that's coming across I know the phone's ringing, but this is more important. I don't really want to leave this at the moment. Yep, that temperature's stabilised out there now at ooh, no, pretty much 140, that thermometer is saying. So we would hope that that vapour that's coming across now is the ester. And I'm getting that really strong smell now of the banana. So hopefully that is um, that's that, that chemical, that 3-methyl butyl ethanoate that we're just trying to make. Sorry, Taylor's just walked in to see what I'm doing. Yeah, we're making 3-methyl butyl ethanoate, which is actually one of the smells that gives banana its smell. So you yeah, might get that smell of banana lollies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So you can just step into the video and say, just, you know, since the people can't smell, <laughs> even with a face mask, it's very strong. You can get that, that banana smell. Um, do you just want me to go on with the cleavers and that? Yeah, um, I'm almost done here, so okay. then you can come back in here. Well, yeah. You can come in here and work anyway if you want. Yep. Yeah. Um, we'll go through some stuff. Sorry, it's just taking a bit longer than I thought it would. Yeah, right. Okay, so you can see now it's almost all boiled away. Um, if there is any other impurities with a higher boiling point, we don't want those to come across. So we just keep an eye on the thermometer. That's sitting still, it's about 141 degrees now, so it hasn't shot up, it doesn't look like another layer. So there we have it. We've reacted ethanoic acid with 3-methylbutanol to form the ester plus water condensation reaction. We've used, I'll rub that bit off, but we've used reflux to speed up the reaction with the heat. I'm just gonna turn that off now, sorry, because that's almost all gone. We've used reflux to speed it up, plus the condenser to stop losing all the, the, the reactants and the products um, from evaporating due to the heating. Um, we also added concentrated sulfuric acid as a catalyst. Then we have purified our mixture of 3-methyl butyl ethanoate by doing a combination of two things. We have done the, what I call the solvent extraction, so separated the non-polar and the polar layers. We've added carbonate to help push the acetic, well, to make the acetic acid form the um, acetate lines, which will dissolve more in the water layer and push them into the water layer. And then we have done a distillation to help separate out the components based on the boiling point. We've collected the stuff that come across below 100, at 132 and below, which would be the unreacted alcohol and the carboxylic acid, the acetic acid, and we've got the layer that's come across after. We've left a little bit in the bottom, just in case there was any sulfuric acid or something with a high boiling point. And this here, and it does, it has a very sweet banana lolly type smell. If you want to know what this here smells like, Go down to your local supermarket, buy a packet of banana lollies, smell them, and they will smell exactly like the ester that we have just made here. And, you know, lots of fruits, fresh bread, lots of things that have that nice, sweet, fruity smell is because of esters. Not necessarily this ester, but all esters have these sweet, fruity smells. Hopefully now I can cut that together and that will be not quite as good as doing it yourself, but will give you a pretty good idea of what is involved in the preparation of an ester. Cheers.